Okay, everybody, I'm going to start with something slightly off-piste, simply because I wanted to uh, move on from uh, what Rajesh and his group were doing, which was mentioning the judge, because um, I've only been sitting as a judge now for a year and a half. So I'm talking to you really as a barrister, which I was for 27 years, uh, and a trial barrister, a trial lawyer almost completely. Uh, but uh, now that I'm sitting as a judge, um, I am doing an awful lot of trial law, but in order to just have a little bit of diversity, I'm doing the odd civil matter, um, which is a learning curve for me. So I wanted to just go to what was mentioned, which is that we've been focusing upon questions and answers in submission advocacy. I'm going to talk to you, in fact, about trial advocacy, questions and answers with experts, questions and answers with witnesses, totally different exercise. But I wanted to talk about questions and answers from the bench. And I want to support what has been said. If the bench asks a question, it wants the answer. It do not, does not want a total fudge back. It does not want bullshit. It, they have, I hope, read the papers. And so a direct answer back is the only way forward. Because I doubt very much that there are very, very many judges that I know who would let you get away with sticking it in your back pocket and coming back to it later. So if you have to stick it in your back pocket because you haven't thought about it, because it's come from left field, say so. That's the way to deal with it. You say, I'm terribly sorry, my lady, my lord, your honour, sir. I'm terribly sorry. I haven't actually got an answer for you for that at the moment, but I will come back to you on it. Please may I move on. Honesty will get you everywhere. Being shifty will get you nowhere and you will lose credibility. So can I just say that? I put that marker down for everybody. <laughs> that uh, we can tell. It's in the eyes every single time. And we have this incredible, it's something that's occurred to me since sitting. It's a totally different feeling. I was in trial for 27 years. The courtroom is my home. I'm very, very comfortable in a courtroom. And the minute I sat on the bench, it was as, as if I was in a goldfish bowl. <laughs> I felt like everybody's eyes were on me. I felt like I couldn't breathe most of the time. Uh, I think everybody's eyes most probably are still on me because I'm the person that has to make the decision most of the time. But the point is that what you think the communication should be shifts when you become the person being communicated with. It shifts significantly. And so what I'm going to try and get over to you today is that difference in the, in, in the communication. And I'm not going to do the one-on-one. -on -one. I want to make a point about the triangle of communication, which is the person who is asking questions in civil trials or criminal trials of a witness. Because what is important for you to understand is this, that although you are asking a question of the witness, you are communicating something quite different to the judge. You are telling the judge, here I am on my roadmap, judge, the style of my questioning, the chronology of my questioning is telling you what my roadmap is, because I haven't necessarily had the opportunity to tell you, especially if you're defense counsel. These questions, judge, have neon lights on for you. They are telling you where I am going. And in fact, especially as defense counsel, when you're cross-examining, you don't really give a stuff what the answer is because the witness is never going to give you the answer you want if you're defense counsel, are they? It's very unlikely they're going to go, it's a fair cop, gov, I'm sorry, I did it. So what you are doing is saying, here you are, judge, here are my building blocks. This is where I'm going with my ultimate submission. And it's important for you to understand that because just as anybody that's ever been an advocate and had to be on their feet, and we go back to the thinking on your feet the whole time, what I'm doing as an advocate is I know where I want to go, I know what I want to get out of my witness, and I'm starting on that roadmap. And I'm putting all the right signposts up because I'm trying to take the witness with me where I'm going. At the same time, I'm only half listening to the answer because I'm saying to myself, am I going to get the answer I want 
What is my next question? Is it the question I thought it was going to be? Is it going to be a different question? Has the judge written down what the answer is? If I've got a jury, is the jury actually paying attention to what the answer is? All of that is going on, even although all I've done is ask a question so far. Then I'm going to wait for the answer to come back whilst at the same time, of course, making a note of my question and making a note of the answer, because otherwise I'm going to come up st unstuck later. And then I've got to go to the next question. So there's a lot going on in your head at that time, because most of the time you haven't had the opportunity to settle into your witness. You don't know how this witness is going to take to you. If you've had an expert witness, which I'll come to in a minute, that's fine. You've got your language and your rapport going. But with a lay witness, he's a completely new creature. And you may think, I'm asking a very simple question that is a, there's a fairly obvious answer to. I either have an affidavit or a witness statement, which has it written down there. And he signed it. So he must be able to give me this answer. And he doesn't. <laughs> and I've had that happen quite often. <laughs> All right, he doesn't. So already you're having to change what you thought was going to be your relationship with the witness in order to just get out of that witness the case that you want to establish your case, which now is starting to be a bit, little bit of an uphill battle, whereas you thought this was going to be a done deal, whilst at the same time you're talking to the judge about the law and the facts mingled into it and establishing your case. So there are difficulties even with a lay witness as how you go about being an advocate and how you manage to change that start. So we go back again to tone, pace, um, volubility, all of those things. Some witnesses who are very timid need you to start fairly timid. You need to be assertive. You need to show them you're in control and will take care of them if they're your witness. But you have to start, perhaps, in a style that doesn't suit you in order to start to create that rapport. But at the same time, you may find you have the type of judge that doesn't like that. There are a number of judges some people here will have definitely seen them. There are a number of judges where you start asking a question and the judge is all, all the time going, and move on, move on, I've got that point, move on, <laughs> yes? And there's you trying to establish this rapport with your witness to get the best out of them and then you've got pressure from the bench, which is why I talk about the triangle, because the rapport goes both ways as well. And you've got to create the balance between the two in order to establish that rapport. At the same time as, and again the young practitioners will know, being terrified. <laughs> being absolutely terrified because you're on your feet and you know everybody is looking at you and especially the judge who might have a bad reputation for being really snotty with people. So, a tip that I try to give people and it's very hard is you can never be too slow, ever. Take your time. Because if you take your time, you take control back of what your performance is. And you take control back from the judge. Hate to say this, don't use this against me. <laughs> you should be in control. I'm a great believer of this as a barrister. It's when you're on your feet, that court is yours, not the judge's. The judge will give it to you if you are prepared, if you have the right legal ease, if you present your case like you know what you're doing, the judge will give you their court. They will allow you the, to run the case as you want it to be run. If you shuffle, if you are timid, if your head is down, if the papers are all over the place and the judge can see everything, yes? then the judge won't give you the court. You won't even have got on your feet before the judge is taking it back and saying, this is my court and I'm going to do it my way now because you've already lost me. I don't trust you anymore. 
So you can see that even from the beginning, before you ask a question, you've created a relationship, a positive or negative relationship with your bench. So it's very important. I, it goes without saying, everybody, I'm sure people were saying this morning, preparation is everything. Absolutely, you can never, ever, ever be too prepared. But if you are prepared, it shows. It shows outwardly and it shows inwardly because you know, I don't care what she's going to ask me. I know the answer. It shouldn't be, don't worry about that young man. I didn't know the answer. I'll come back to it later. It should be, I knew the answer. I might need some time to gather my thoughts while I think about how I'm going to verbalize that answer so it's effective. But I prepared so I know what the answer is. So it's, it's inside and outside, and the whole thing is a presentation that you need to instill into students. And the, the inside bit comes from the presentation. It also comes from what I just said, which is really important. Allowing them, trust, trusting themselves to use their instincts. We can't, even after 30 years, know all the law. <laughs> even if we've only done the rules of evidence in criminal trials, I still think, is that right? Isn't that right? But instinctively, I will come up with an answer. Common sense underpins most law. Allow your students to use their common sense when they're trying to be advocates because they have to be on their feet all the time and they have to think quickly and they don't have the ability to have 10 minutes for Surrey Buttle. They won't. You know, oh, I haven't thought about what I'm going to say yet, so judge, just go out and have a cup of coffee, will you, while I think about it, and then I'll come back and give you this whiz kid answer, which the judge is going to blow out of the water anyway, chances are. So that sort of thing needs to be thought about for them, how you instill into them a degree of confidence within their abilities to begin with, because it will grow, won't it? It's the same with lecturing. When you're first lecturing, when you're first doing your teaching plan, you deliver it, don't you? And you think, that didn't work. Or, wow, they were all wonderful. Or, I've got the nine o'clock in the morning slot. That's going to be hard work <laughs> to get them all awake. Or you've got the late night one. And you change how you deliver it. You change your pace. And I want to go back to pace. A witness's answer to you is directly proportional to the quality of the question. It never changes that rule. If you ask a crap question, you will get a crap answer. <laughs> if you ask the question in a, an, a, a timid and uncertain way, the witness will not give you a confident answer. If you will become aggressive, the witness will become aggressive back. Everything that you do, do has an equal and sometimes opposite reaction. That's something they need to understand in the relationship. It isn't just, have I written down 300 questions here, which is what all the Hong Kong students do, everybody. All right? They have a whole list and they start at the beginning and they ask the questions and they don't listen to the answer. And then they go on to the next question and they think they've done a wonderful job. Yes. So, yes, rule number two, listen to the answer first before you move on to the second question. But they do need to create a relationship. If you create a relationship with a witness, just as if you create a relationship with your colleagues, you get on better with them, don't you? That you're more likely to say, can I have some funding for something and get them to at least listen to you about the funding than if they think you're a, an idiot and they don't want to give you any funding for anything. It's the same thing. A witness won't open up. And so you will have heard a number of times, anybody that's in teaching of advocacy, that cross-examination is not cross-examination. If you are cross with a witness, that witness is definitely not giving you any information. But if you are charming with a witness, then the witness might, maybe, once in your career, give you the answer that you want. But if you are charming with a judge, you will almost always, at least, get they will listen to you. Charm will get you in an awful lot of places. If you are just pleasant and professional 
and listen to the judge and answer the judge charmingly with charm, then the judge may listen to the rubbish answer you give them. <laughs> All right? And at least give you the benefit of the doubt. And the judge may then give you a hint at where you need to go in order to answer the question that they are putting to you. And can I say this? Because certainly when I was on the other side of the bench, I always thought when a judge asked me a question, they were playing with me. You know, let's see if she really knows what she's talking about, or let's see if she's read the papers. And I can think of a few judges, but I'm not going to mention them now, who did that. I certainly have not come across that the other side. Speaking to judges now on a daily basis over coffee and everything else, if they're asking questions, they really just want to know the answer. Yes, they just, if they say, look, I don't need to, you to tell me about American cyanamide. No, I know it backwards. Please don't do that. But isn't your problem this? They want you to answer that problem and they've given you a heads up. So what do you do? You throw it back at them and you put it in your back pocket and go, I don't care that I've got a heads up. I'm actually just going to go off and do the bit that I've prepared now that you do have just told me you don't want so that I can think about and panic about the fact that I can't answer the question. You know, if going back to what I said at the beginning, if you can't answer the question, if it's that bad and it's that important, say, I'm terribly sorry, please would you give me five minutes to take instructions now and I'll answer you now if your ladyship would rise, if it's that bad. But bullshitting won't get you anywhere. So I'm sorry, I'm going back to the witness and the advocate and questions and answers in court and what your students should be looking to do. We've talked about the fact that you have to establish rapport. We've talked about the fact that you have to let the judge know what your road map is. That is a different piece of communication if you happen to be, but it might be a little way down the line, happen to have a jury there as well, you've got to be keeping a weather eye on the jury. But going back to rebuttal and surrebuttal, when you're establishing your questions with witnesses, you have to also think about what your opposition is going to ask. And you should be saying to yourself, shall I take the wind out of their sails? And I'll ask it anyway, because at least then I've got my first bite of the cherry of seeing if I can resolve whatever problem comes out. They're going to pick it up and run with it, but then I get to re-X. So, I've got, so I'm looking to the judge as if I'm not scared of this point. And that's quite a good tactic in some situations. Obviously, there are other situations where you could say to yourself, my opponent's a bit of an idiot, so if I keep quiet, he's never going to think of it, and I'm, that way the point will never come up. It's another thing, isn't it, about thinking on your feet. What do I ask and what don't I ask? How far do I go in establishing both my case and the rebutting the case against me within the question and answer technique. So I want to take that because I want to move on and take that point into expert witnesses, which is something I did quite a bit of. Expert witnesses are prepared. They aren't a creature that you've got to work out as soon as they come into court. They are somebody you're going to have had a conference with and you are going to be able to chat to them and they are going to be able to educate you. You will never know as much as an expert witness and so you have to be humble enough to be able to say to your expert witness, right, I've got this issue, please explain it to me. And then you have to be humble enough to say, I didn't understand that. Please, can you come down another level? And you keep going down to another level to the point at which you understand and that is the level at which it's delivered in court. You can't start going back up again. It has to be basic because I as the judge, listening to an expert, I don't want to be embarrassed with saying, Mr. Wong, I didn't understand that. Can we do that again? You've got to be able to present the case in a way that, that's going to be attractive to the judge. And so with expert witnesses, you need that conferencing so that you can learn about his expertise without trying to surpass him. But also so he learns about your expertise. 
He learns about, your, learns about your language, the way questions are asked and answered, the sorts of things that are being established, understanding the issues, the legal issues in the case against the facts. He needs to be made comfortable. And that's what the conferencing is for. And that is a different dynamic than the question and answer dynamic in court. It requires a much more personal, much more professional and equal and respectful relationship, which is perhaps a different dynamic than you might have with a lay witness. You might never be disrespectful to any witness, but it's a different dynamic to a lay witness. It's equally a different dynamic to the one you have with a judge because the respect needs to be shown from you towards the bench. If you show the bench disrespect, you're going to be slapped against a wall and never to be seen again. So you need to understand that the language you use differs depending upon the type of the witness you've got, what you're trying to achieve, and who you are trying to actually communicate with. And your communication is really only going towards the bench. I could actually talk forever, I'm so sorry. <laughs> but that's all you're getting today. <laughs>